Today we're talking about estrogen. If you know any of the hormones, you probably know this one, and testosterone. These are two of what we call the sex hormones. And if you were taught these in school, you were probably taught that estrogen is the more feminine one, while testosterone makes men more manly. Of course, that's way too simple of a description. All genders make all sex hormones. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take your middle school definition of sex hormones and we're just gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna politely put it in the trash. The discovery of the sex hormones themselves weren't super exciting. So in this video, we're gonna learn about how estrogen is involved in two of the phenomenon that you hear about all the time, birth control and menopause. Like we saw in the puberty episode, you can't ignore periods, but you do have to go kinda out of your way to uncover the details. Luckily, if money's on the line, discoveries tend to get made. Like most of society has been farmers since society itself existed, and if that's you, then you're very interested in learning how animals reproduce because that means you get to feed your family. And one of the first things that we learned was that not all female mammals reproduce the same. They have some things in common, like they tend to fertilize the egg cell inside the body and carry their babies in their uterus, except these guys and this continent. Either way, it's mostly the same. But we started picking up on something a little less obvious. Fertility is cyclical. Mammals aren't ready to mate at all times of every day. Like if you've heard that a dog is in heat before, then you've heard what I'm talking about. So by the early 1900s, researchers started looking into the crossover between mammals. And in 1906, researchers took secretions from human ovaries and saw that it triggered something called estrus in non-human female mammals. The estrus cycle is kind of like the human menstrual cycle in that it's preparing the body to possibly become pregnant. So something in that human ovary extract was triggering estrus, hence estrogen. We're gonna talk about human menstruation in depth in a little bit, but there are some pretty key differences between that and estrus. A big difference is what's done with the endometrium if the body is in fact not pregnant. In estrus, the endometrium is resorbed, but in menstruation, it's shed out along with the blood and other menses. That's the part that's usually called the period. So into the 20th century, we had this idea that there was some chemical in the ovary that was involved in periods, and that there was a time in a woman's life when those periods stopped menopause. By the 1920s, cow and sheep ovary extracts were being used in early menopause relief treatments. Then in 1929, estrogen as a hormone itself was finally isolated. But again, not a super exciting story, so we're not gonna get into it. But we did realize that there were multiple forms of estrogen, including estradiol, esterone, estriol, and estrotrol. You should be noticing a phonetic theme here. And then through the more microbio and chemical side of things, we started realizing that this hormone really wasn't as mysterious as we had made it out to be. You see, estrogen isn't just like a magic woman hormone. Chemically, the sex hormones are just fancy cholesterol. To make estrogen, dietary cholesterol gets converted into a type of progesterone, which becomes testosterone, which the ovaries convert into the most powerful type of estrogen called estradiol. Cool, so now you're like, yeah, uh-huh, this is good. We're finally gonna use our powers to make periods less sucky, right? No, despite all the new insight, you still couldn't talk about periods in public. Like the social taboo was so strong that tampons weren't commercially available in America until 1936. Why did such a straightforward design take so long? Well, mostly because men have been classically terrible when it comes to helping with women's health issues and still are. Jokes aside, this is an incredibly important human rights topic, so I'm gonna include lots of extra reading and viewing down in the description. Please check it out. So going forward, we had to connect the dots between the chemical world of hormones and the behavioral, cultural, and social aspects of reproduction. We knew that part of menstruation resulted in ovulation, the release of an egg cell, which then either gets fertilized and results in pregnancy, or it doesn't, which results in a period. Now, women's bodies change quite a bit during pregnancy, but one of the features is that there's a temporary stoppage of periods. Their body wouldn't get ready to make another baby while it's already giving resources to the one that's growing. And that leads to the most logical complaint of of all time. Periods suck, so why is your body punishing you for not being pregnant? And what if we could trick the body into thinking it's pregnant without the whole actually being pregnant part? That makes sense, but there's a lot to go into first. Like, there's a huge variation from person to person when it comes to menstrual cycles. No two people are identical. Like, look at this graph for estradiol. Look at this enormous range. There's technically an average because of math, but in reading this graph, our main takeaways are that menstruation is cyclical, these events happen in stages and that every body is different. And it's not just estrogen that's fluctuating throughout the month, there are a lot of hormones involved here. We're gonna start the cycle after proper menstruation. Gonadotropin releasing hormone is released by the hypothalamus, which triggers follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. 
Think of these hormones as a way to start nudging an egg out of the ovary. As the egg starts growing, estrogen starts rising in preparation for that egg to be released. All those hormones keep going up until the egg is finally released, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormones shoot up directly before that and then quickly fall. It makes sense, they've done their job of prepping the egg cell for ovulation, then they back off, they don't need to get another egg ready right this second. But the body does need to prep for possible pregnancy. So the empty egg follicle, aka the corpus luteum, squeezes out some estrogen and progesterone, which helps line the uterus with mucus. A fertilized egg might be hanging out there for a couple months, it's gotta get ready. So then, the moment of truth. One of two things can happen depending on whether the egg cell got fertilized or not. If the egg is now hosting a visitor, a placenta will start forming. You're pregnant, so that's the structure that'll nourish the growing baby. The placenta gives off a hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin, signaling to the rest of the body that you are indeed pregnant. But if not, estrogen and progesterone drop, and since your body isn't using that uterine lining it worked so hard to make, it ejects it. And that's the period part. Again, there's a lot of variation between women and different age groups and different medical conditions, but now you at least know what each of the hormones does. Now, it wasn't estrogen, but progesterone that researchers were looking at during the invention of the first hormonal birth control pill, what we're gonna just call the pill. In the 1930s, researchers found that shooting a ton of progesterone into animals could temporarily stop ovulation. In the next decade, the same would be done in humans with a synthetic form of progesterone called progestin. Which makes sense. Higher progesterone is a signal that your body is pregnant, and you can't get pregnant when you're already pregnant. Even though the dosage has been modified since then, it's still the same concept that the pill uses today. Mimic the hormonal profile of pregnancy so that your body doesn't think it should ovulate. Now, put yourself back in the 1940s and 50s and think about women's rights and attitudes towards sex positivity. It was a different time. So back then, the pill wasn't marketed as birth control, but as cycle control. Then, in America at least, the 1970s happened, and as Danny Trejo put it in Anchorman, Ladies can do stuff now! And this is where we get to the second part of the estrogen story. Menopause. For those unfamiliar, menopause is when your ovaries are like, nah, we're not gonna make hormones for you anymore, and it usually happens when you're in your 50s, has some uncomfortable side effects, and it's a totally natural part of a woman's life. So naturally, doctors were like, hey, if your ovaries aren't making estrogen and you're in pain, then let's give you some synthetic estrogen and see what happens. I mean, we've been doing it since before we even know what hormones were, so let's give it a shot. So from 1942 onward, estrogen was heavily used for menopause symptom relief. And the decades that followed afterwards were a roller coaster. Sales of estrogen-based menopause relief kept going up until 1975, when reports of endometrial cancer in estrogen users started popping up. But then, other reports came out that just adding a little bit of progestin in there might guard against some of that. And in 1982 and 1984, a report showed that a conjugated estrogen tablet by the name of Primarin was able to be effective and help you retain bone mass. Then, in 1985, you had conflicting data about estrogen and risk of cardiovascular disease. Then, in 1991, the Journal of the American Medical Association claimed that estrogen users actually had a decreased mortality compared to non-estrogen users. I told you, this story is a roller coaster. And then, in 2002, as if researchers could hear the collective frustration of estrogen users demanding a clear answer, a massive, announcement was made. The Women's Health Initiative came out and reported that estrogen use actually caused more harm than good, and thereafter, estrogen use declined. Now, you can usually tell how influential research is by how many citations it has. Yeah, this report has 14 thousand citations. When I say it was massively impactful, that's what I'm talking about. But 2002 was kind of a long time ago now, and our understanding of menopause and of hormone replacement therapy, or HRT, has progressed since then. Like, maybe it's not that your body's estrogen meter is too low, but it's the steepness of the fall-off that gets you. Researchers actually discovered that you could trigger a hot flash if you took a low estrogen woman, put her on estrogen, and then took it away. It's the drop, not like a threshold of estrogen. Of course, this is tricky to study because it seems like humans are the only animals that experience hot flashes. Except for maybe orca whales, interestingly enough. The current theory, thanks in part to research by Dr. Naomi Rantz, is that certain cells in the hypothalamus get swollen and mess up women's internal temperature control centers, which leads to those hot flash symptoms. This one chemical called neurokinin B might be responsible as well, but we still need more information. Next time, gentlemen, we're having a chat. It's time for the story of testosterone and masculinity. Have fun, be good, and I'll see you next time. Yeah.